So welcome. Elizabeth is going to be our Omze. Yes. So start whenever you feel like it. Okay. Um, I'm not sure if somebody is presenting the book, but if not, I can go grab mine. Um, I don't see it. There we go. <laughs> that's that's at the end. Oh, there we go. Okay. All righty. <clears throat> Okay, I think I see the seven line prayer. Yeah. Which is at the end, correct? Yeah. No, it's the beginning. Oh, we're doing this in the beginning. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't realize yeah, that. Okay. Hey. Yasin Choji Nong Juye Hema Juni She Shudra Kordu Kadro Mang Poko Keki Jesu Dong Juki Shinji Loji She Suso Guru Pema Siri Hum. Om Yorjan Gokik Nam Cham Sham. Hema Gesa Dang Pola. Yasin Choji Nam Juye. Pema Junji She Jutrag. Kordu kajo man poko keki jesu dong juki chinji loji sheng su so guru pema siri hung or jin yoji nong chom chom tema gesa Dong Guru Pema Siri Praise to the Shakyamuni Buddha, teacher, foe destroyer, thus gone. Fully and perfectly awakened Buddha, endowed with knowledge and good conduct, gone to bliss, knower of the world, helmsman of ordinary beings to be tamed, supreme one, teacher of all gods and men, Buddha, foe destroyer, glorious victorious one, Shakyamuni, to you I pay homage, make offerings, and go for refuge. Teacher, foe destroyer, thus gone, fully and perfectly awakened Buddha, endowed with knowledge and good conduct, Gone to bliss, knower of the world, helmsman of ordinary beings to be tamed, supreme one, teacher of all gods and men, Buddha, foe destroyer, glorious victorious one, Shakyamuni, to you I pay homage, make offerings, and go for refuge. When you, chief of humans, were born, you took seven steps on this great earth, and you said, I am supreme in this world. To you who were wise at that time, I prostrate. Completely pure body, supremely fine form, ocean of wisdom like a golden mountain, fame that blazes in the three worlds, supreme protector, to you I prostrate, endowed with the supreme marks, a face like the stainless moon, a color like gold, to you I pay homage, the three worlds who are not like you, who is free from dust, matchless one, endowed with knowledge, to you I prostrate, protector, endowed with great compassion, omniscient teacher, field of ocean-like merits and good qualities, to the dust gone, I prostrate. Through, pu through purity, free from attachment, 
through virtue releases from the evil gone realms, unique, supreme, ultimate meaning to the Dharma that brings peace, I prostrate. From freedom, teaching the path, well abiding in the pure trainings, holy field endowed with good qualities, to the Sangha also, I prostrate. Homage to the Supreme Buddha, homage to the Dharma refuge, homage to the great Sangha, to all three ever devout homage. To all worthy of respect, bowing with bodies as many as all realms, atoms, and all aspects, with supreme faith I pay homage. Do not commit any non-virtuous action. Accumulate virtue and goodness. Subdue your own mind. This is the teaching of the Buddha. Like a star, a mirage, a lamp, illusion, drops of dew, bubbles, dreams, lightning, and clouds. Look at all conditioned phenomena as such. Due to this merit, having attained the state of the all-seeing, and thereby subduing the enemy of faults, may liberate migrators from the ocean of existence, stirred by the waves of aging, sickness, and death. I take refuge in the Guru. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dharma. I take refuge in the Sangha. I take refuge in the Guru. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dharma. I take refuge in the Sangha. I take refuge in the Guru. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dharma. I take refuge in the Sangha. I take refuge until I'm enlightened in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha by the positive potential I create by listening to the Dharma. May I attain Buddhahood in order to benefit all sentient beings. May all sentient beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. May all sentient beings be free of suffering and the causes of suffering. May all sentient beings be inseparable from the joyful happiness that is free from suffering. May all sentient beings abide in equanimity, free from holding some close and others distant. Respectfully, I prostrate with my body, speech, and mind. I present clouds of every type of offering, actual and imagined. I confess all my negative actions accumulated since beginningless time and rejoice in the virtuous actions of all ordinary and noble beings. Please, Buddha, remain as our guide and turn the wheel of Dharma until samsara ends. Through the merit created by myself and others, may the two bodhicittas ripen and may attain Buddhahood for the sake of all sentient beings. This offering I make of a precious jeweled mandala, together with pure other pure offerings and wealth and the virtues we have collected throughout the times with the three times of our body, speech, and mind. O oh, my masters, my yadams, and the three precious jewels, I offer all to you with unwavering faith. Accepting these out of your boundless compassion, please send forth the waves of your blessings. Iram gunu radakam malakti mandalakam niratiyami. Sorry, I'm nervous, guys. <laughs> I've never done this before. <laughs> ah. I prostrate to the Arya triple gem. Thus did I hear at one time. The Bhagavan was dwelling on the mass of vultures mountains on Rajagriya, together with a great community of monks and a great community of bodhisattvas. At that time, the Bhagavan was absorbed in the concentration on the categories of phenomena called profound perception. Also at that time, the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya, Avalokiteshvara looked upon the pr very practice of the profound perfection of wisdom and behold those five aggregates also as empty of inherent nature. Then, through the power of Buddha, the Venerable Shariputra said this to the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya, Avalokiteshvara, how should any son of the lineage who wishes to train to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom? He said that, and the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya, Avalokiteshvara said this to the Venerable Shariputra, Shariputra, any son of the lineage or daughter of the lineage who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom should look upon it like this, correctly and repeatedly, holding those five aggregates also as empty of inherent nature. Form is empty. Emptiness is form. Emptiness is not other than form. Form is also not other than emptiness. In the same way, feeling, discrimination, compositional factors, and consciousness are empty. Shariputra. Likewise, all phenomena are emptiness, without characteristic, unproduced, unceased, stainless, not without stain, not deficient, not fulfilled. Shariputra, 
therefore, in emptiness, there is no form, no feeling, no discrimination, no compositional factors, no consciousness, no eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind, no visual form, no sound, no odor, no taste, no object of touch, and no phenomenon. There is no eye element, and so on, and including no mind element, and no mental consciousness element. There is no ignorance, no extinction of ignorance, and so on, and up to and including no aging and death, and no extinction of aging and death. Similarly, there is no suffering, origination, cessation, and path. There is no exalted wisdom, no attainment, and also no non-attainment. Shariputra, therefore, because there is no attainment, bodhisattvas rely on and dwell in the perfection of wisdom, the mind without obscuration and without fear. Having completely passed beyond error, they reach the end point of nirvana. The, all the Buddhas who dwell in the three times also manifestly completely awaken to unsurpassable, perfect, complete enlightenment in reliance on the perfection of wisdom. Therefore, the mantra of the perfection of wisdom, the mantra of great knowledge, the unsurpassed mantra, the mantra equal to the unequaled, the mantra that thoroughly pacifies all suffering should be known as the truth since it is not false. The mantra of the perfection of wisdom is declared, Tayata, Gate Gate, Paragate, Parasam Gate, Bodhisoha. I'll repeat that 21 times. Tayata, gate gate, paragate, parasum gate, bodhisoha. Shariputra, the bodhisattva, mahasattva, should train in the profound perfection of wisdom like that. Then the Bhagavan arose from that concentration and commended the bodhisattva, mahasattva, Arya, Avalokiteshvara, saying, Well said, well said, son of the lineage, it is like that, it is like that. One should practice the profound perfection of wisdom, just as you've indicated. Even the Tathagatas rejoice. The Bhagavan, having thus spoken, the Venerable Shadibhariputra, the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya, Avalokiteshvara, those surrounding in their entirety along with the world of gods, humans, Ajuras, and Gandharvas, were overjoyed and highly praised that spoken by the Bhagavan. Uh, so good morning. Um, I'm going to uh, uh, try to cover a lot today since it's uh, the last um, Dharma talk for the year. Uh, I'm hoping we can um, uh, see the uh, tea lights that have been lit um, on my right side on the altar. Um, I may have to have uh, Connor do a uh, technical adjustment here. So, uh, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, can you see? So, <clears throat> uh, these are to honor uh, one of our teachers and friends, Geshe Sewang from the dock. Um, it's, uh, it was his birthday this week. Um, and, uh, uh, I've done some Tara practice for his long life and um, sent him birthday greetings. Uh, so um, I hope people have the opportunity to meet Geshe Sewang in person. Uh, he may not even be able to travel this year and uh, coming up in 2021 and maybe 2022, I'm not sure. Um, he's invited a number of us uh, to travel to Ladakh. Um, Ladakh is uh, part of uh, India, um, 
nationally, but uh, culturally it's uh, Tibetan. And um, I would like to go. If you're thinking of going, you probably need at least three weeks, you know, like travel and then get acclimated because the dock is, um, I don't know what, 3,000 meters, something like that, 10,000 feet. It's really high. So um, you don't want to rush in and then uh, rush out. But uh, I'll make aspirations for um, myself and others who would like to visit um, uh, Ladakh uh, to do that in the future. It's difficult to visit Tibet, um, particularly now. Uh, and if we visit Tibet, uh, we have to go in a very regulated way for not sneaking in because um, it is uh, still under a very repressive uh, regime. So uh, if people want to experience um, very classic Tibetan culture, Ladakh is uh, one way to do it. Um, Geshe uh, Sewang has been tireless um, in promoting um, uh, activities in Ladakh that benefit others, particularly the uh, school for the children. So um, it's actually... Uh, it's not quite a monastery school. It's actually like an independent school that um, uh, not not necessarily for orphans, but for the kids in the valley um, to get a basic education and um, uh, be able to go on for further education if they want to. So uh, I like it a lot because it's not just a monastery school in the sense that uh, the understanding is there necessarily stay on. Uh, when they grow up, but just basically a school. So uh, we've been very generous from our Sangha with Geshe Sewang, and uh, it's really paid off. So uh, this is just a shout out. Uh, happy birthday, Geshe La. Um, uh, you're really a good friend, and I appreciate it. So thank you. Please live long. <clears throat> and we'll continue to make aspirations uh, that your wishes be fulfilled. Um, <clears throat> It's very classically uh, for a teacher to um, be asked to teach and then uh, to teach on a subject that um, uh, has been suggested by students. So uh, Connor suggested a talk on the um, 12 links of dependent origination or 12 Madonnas. Uh, so I'm just going to uh, slowly uh, put a toe in on that uh, today. <clears throat> That's a very detailed talk, but I appreciate him um, making that offer. So uh, you know, please, people, if you want teachings for next year um, or clarifications, then um, maybe you can uh, you know, send those in via email. I want to hear teaching on this and so forth. Also, I want to give uh, an opportunity for every refuge Sangha member to give a talk on Sunday uh, under my direction so that you have that unique experience of um, you know, sharing your journey. I think we're really the only Dharma center that does this. Um, people, uh, some Dharma friends in the past have said, are you sure you want you know, people giving talks? You never know what they're gonna say. And that's true, that's one of the lovely parts uh, because, but. Uh, when people work closely together with me and then they're willing to give a talk in front of uh, their peers, uh, I think a new confidence is born and uh, a new way to hear Dharma. So uh, I've never heard any of the Dharma students here uh, you know, give something that's way out of line at all. They've all been inspiring. Uh, so if you're a refuge student and you haven't given a Dharma talk yet, uh, you will be contacted, and those who have given talks, we will contact you because I'm just here a couple of times a week, a couple of times a month, right? So, and then we have many opportunities online. I've asked people to, of course, keep uh, uh, attending as much as possible Kansar Ramshay's talks, um, uh, who go into great detail about, uh, you know, topics that. Um, aren't dealt, dealt as much in a video or public way. Um, so he's truly fearless and very innovative and, uh, um, you know, is a real uh, 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 friend 
So um, those are uh, posted on our uh, the the Roar um, newsletter we put out. So please watch. And then of course things from other teachers that are qualified um, are in abundance now, and I um, I'm glad people are taking advantage of that. Whether it's Dalai Lama or um, Zikar Rinpoche or you know so forth, um, these are wonderful opportunities. So thank you for tuning in day two. Hmm. <clears throat> we will be uh, opening up sometime next year, as long as we um, all try to follow as best possible practices. So we are following, you know, County of Sacramento and CDC and government uh, Governor Newsom policies, and I ask everyone to uh, be as scientific as possible. Uh, Dharma people do believe in science. Science is um, full of experiment and probabilities and um, isn't always perfect. So it doesn't deal in some of the ultimate truths, uh, but conventional truths are extremely important. So conventional truth is that we have a body and the body responds to certain causes and effects. So uh, we, we wanna take care of our health. So there's no way that uh, Dharma people are uh, science deniers or um, denying the impact of uh, the COVID. Um, when we are young and maybe uh, feel immortal, uh, perhaps we're not feeling as afraid, but we can still uh, pass on uh, the virus. And I can think of several older people that I don't want to pass, uh, have passed into the next life, uh, myself included, since I'll be turning 68 next year. Uh, so, and I can think of uh, family members that are older that I don't want to see die unnecessarily. So please continue to make prayers that um, people that are meant to have long life will have long life and uh, make prayers for the uh, nurses and uh, doctors and social workers and um, uh, special uh, prayers for therapists. Uh, maybe James, uh, you and I can work up a special prayer for um, uh, prayer for therapists <laughs> uh, because uh, therapists uh, we're we're uh, talking, you know, to people for 45, 50 minutes an hour, like one on one, right? So uh, uh, I am continuing to um, meet with people that want to meet and are leading reasonably safe lives at Middleway Health. So um, uh, I'm not considered, and I don't, I don't think James were considered frontline workers, <laughs> but we should be. What do you, don't you think? So um, all those people that uh, you know are working uh, with people in person really are frontline workers. So uh, hopefully we can get vaccine soon. Um, uh, I know there are problems with all vaccines and side effects, but the general approach is that it's, it's going to be better than not doing it. Um, I talk a lot to doctors and nurses and um, epidemiologists actually, and uh, uh, I know there can be side effects. So if people have certain allergies, they should be carrying their you know, epinephrine pens and so forth. But uh, I, just can't believe that uh, not not taking any kind of vaccine would, uh, you know, necessarily be a good idea. Still, everyone's up to um, their own. Uh, they have to make their own choices around that. But um, I I live in the scientific medical world, so uh, I will be getting vaccinated when. Uh, you know, Kaiser or Dr. Altshuler makes it uh, available. Um, I can't believe I, people wouldn't want to get a polio vaccine or um, any of the vaccines around the deadly diseases that we've been able to eradicate and hopefully uh, we can get a handle on this. So I know I'm going on, but we have to uh, be aware that uh, the Dharma practice of liberation goes along with uh, science. Um, so. Uh, 
please um, stay safe over the New Year's, and uh, we will be back in the temple as soon as possible. So, uh, when we talk about dependent origination um, in a very uh, uh, simple way, we uh, we say that everything is connected. Uh, everything is so dependent on each other that um, we can't find something separate. We can't find something existing inherently by its own definition alone. So just like we can't find a left without a right or an up without a down, uh, whenever we posit something, uh, it's going to be in, uh, independent, interdependent with uh, other things to help its definition. So <clears throat> that kind of uh, realization of uh, interdependence goes directly to real estate, uh, realizing emptiness and nature mind. Um, but the 12 links um, of dependent origination are based on the same idea, but in the Vajrayana tradition, they're generally talked about to develop the idea of like how samsara comes about, how we get trapped in samsara, how we get trapped in a cycle of uh, unproductive uh, fixations and addictions and how things are screwed up. So uh, it's not so much a description that is leading toward uh, uh, you know, understanding emptiness or nature of mind, but uh, really trying to uh, help people develop uh, uh, the will to escape uh, or clarify samsara. And in the Tibetan tradition, uh, the tanka that is generally um, either on the outside or in the center of the um, inside of a temple is uh, called the wheel of life, where people see Yama, the god of death, holding this uh, circular uh, pie-shaped uh, picture depicting uh, the six realms of existence. And then uh, in smaller um, bits, uh, the 12 nadanas or the 12 uh, aspects that make up uh, samsara. <clears throat> and then at the center, uh, you know, we have the fundamental delusions of ignorance, desire, and, and anger symbolized by uh, appropriate animals, <laughs> who I'm sure wouldn't appreciate being signified that way, but that's um, uh, the symbology. So uh, I wanted to make an attempt to talk about that a little bit today. So I'm just going to read out, uh, uh, there's no other way to do it, but to uh, a little bit for me to read out what the 12 uh, links or the 12 uh, nidanas are. And it, it starts with ignorance. And in the Mahayana tradition, ignorance or avidya, not seeing, is, is the fundamental problem. And this leads to uh, uh, what's called formations. Uh, <clears throat> And formations mean uh, uh, this is leading about to karmic activity. Things are stirred up because of ignorance. I like to say that ignorance isn't a static thing. It's uh, a sense of conflict uh, and a sense of uneasiness. So it's not just basic not knowing. It's also, uh, as Robert Thurman um, so well says, it's knowing the wrong things. So it stirs things up and creates what's called formations. And then from that is created consciousness. So uh, vijnana. Um, vijnana means like dualistic consciousness. It's made up of two words, v, like v, vi, and then jnana, which means uh, knowledge or awareness or consciousness. So it's dualistic. And this is when we um, have started to you know, become, in the West, we might call a little bit self-aware. We're starting to... Uh, you know, have the sense of uh, independence, I'm doing something. So from that becomes uh, name and form, which is uh, the fourth, and the skandhas come about, all the different varieties of uh, mental events and identification of our body comes about. And then uh, the, the faculties develop from that, that's the sixth, called the fifth, the six ayatanas. Um, <clears throat> these are the inner sense faculties. And from there, 
the idea is uh, number six, and the dana is called contact. <clears throat> so the contact is the coming together of uh, the objects, the sense faculty, and the consciousness. So to have um, a full world, so to speak, you have to have, for example, like an eye, you have to have an eye consciousness, and you have to have an eye object. So the our world, as we know, it is created by uh, the uh, basis, like actually having a physical eye, the awareness, so we're actually looking and seeing, and then we're seeing something. Uh, if we're not paying attention, uh, even though uh, we're hearing something or might be looking at something, so the eye's working and the object is there, we're not becoming conscious of it, right? So when we're distracted uh, and thinking about something else, we may not see what's right in front of us. Or of course, if we lose an eye or lose both eyes, we're not going to see outer objects. And then of course, if there are no outer objects, we're not gonna see anything. So uh, this contact is really important to establish like we're kind of here and um, we're, uh, we've created the world, so to speak. Uh, <clears throat> this con contact uh, actually um, creates a, f a feeling, and feeling um, uh, or sensations uh, are in uh, not not like California. California, we say, I feel this, I feel that, when we're really saying, I think this or I think that. Feeling is just pure sensation that's either pleasurable. Uh, not pleasurable or neutral. So pleasant, unpleasant, neutral, like that. So it's very, very basic that when we become, uh, when we contact, uh, something else is generated, which is uh, uh, a feeling sensation of, this is good, I want more of this, or this is not pleasant, I want less of this, and a whole bunch of neutral things where we just kind of go, it is. And then from sensation becomes the eighth nidana called craving. So there develops based on contact and feeling sensation uh, a, a, a desire. So we don't want to be separated from pleasurable sensations and we want to separated from unpleasurable ones and then we're confused actually about the neutral ones so <clears throat> this this starts really at this level this starts the dynamic of push and pull and ignoring and using the ignorance that really characterizes samsara because we want the good stuff and we don't want the bad stuff we basically want to ignore stuff that doesn't pertain to the good stuff and the bad stuff. So our lives become, uh, you know, based upon uh, this contact and craving. That by itself wouldn't be such a big problem, uh, but there's uh, something called in Sanskrit upadana, uh, lenpa, and Tibetan, which is grasping. So um, Grasping is like we are holding on to it. We've we've uh, kind of we've craved it, so which is a very strong craving. But uh, uh, this craving, you know, we don't want to. Uh, excuse me, to, <laughs> maybe I'm miscraving. So after after sensation comes craving. Craving is a desire that's very strong, and uh, we we want more of it and then becomes a grasping where we've like attained it for a moment and we don't want to let go of it is the grasping upadana so the the core piece uh, of the dynamic of samsara is this contact sensation craving and grasping <clears throat> we don't want to uh, be separated from the things and the people we love and like and we definitely want to be separated from the things we don't like, the people we don't like. And when we uh, find a position that works for us, we tend to hold on to it, and that's called grasping. So the tenth is becoming, 
and when we when we say becoming in this sense bhava <clears throat> bhava means um, we we've created enough structure so that we'll uh, take it into the next life but in the daily life we've created enough pattern so that the pattern will repeat itself so samsara is this uh, constant search uh, for pleasurable things, emotional pleasurable things or physical pleasurable things, and then the avoidance of unpleasurable things in people. And then once we figured we, once we thought we figured it out, then we're holding on to it. And that creates uh, repetition. We're gonna experience that same dilemma again. This would all be great if, of course, um, things didn't change, right? So uh, built into the structure uh, is an understanding that uh, things are impermanent. And on top of it, we delusionally think that uh, things exist inherently and as they are from their side and can, can continue to give us uh, pleasure and satisfaction and safety when they can't. So. A couple of pieces of chocolate cake feel really good, but then if I ate the whole cake, I would feel not so good. Then finally, we have rebirth, uh, and we are starting the process over again, whether it's in this life or next, and then we have old age and death. So that is the cycle of the 12 Nadanas, uh, which is meant to arouse in us the desire for uh, release. Like how do we stop this pattern? How do we actually find permanent happiness? How do we escape from permanent pain? Like that. <clears throat> the 12 Nidanas aren't um, structured in a, a literal scientific cause and effect way. Uh, they're structured in a way for contemplation. So, um, they're not like a billiard ball, like necessarily they're causing each other, but not in a, um, oh, it's a direct way. So it's a little bit like we could say, uh, water is the cause of ice, but um, water may not be, right now the water we see may not be ice, you see. So it, each one is related to each other in a cause and effect way, but it's not the same kind of cause like you know, you, you flip on a switch and the light comes on. These are general patterns uh, that uh, the late uh, scholar Stephen Goodman uh, called situational pattern, situational patterning. Does that sound better than the 12 Nadanas? So uh, I'm sorry, I had to be like very professional and go through every single one, but uh, now I'd like to pause for a moment and. Um, See if uh, there are some questions and comments or complaints. While we're thinking of that, um, the emphasis uh, on learning uh, this methodology is to reflect uh, deeply, how did we get in this mess and why are we suffering? So, uh, you know, as we can see, it's, it's a introverted, uh, you know, introspective approach to looking how we are creating our own suffering. We're not denying that there's political, economic, and environmental suffering. We're looking now very closely on how we're perpetuating our own suffering from the inside. <clears throat> so I see lots of faces and some medallions. <laughs> so, uh, Yes. Oh, James, go ahead. Yeah. Do you have a question? I do. Thank you, Lama. Yeah, it's a sure. really awesome talk. Great subject. And thank you, Connor, for asking it. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how we perceive ourselves as permanent and um, unchanging 
existing in this world and how it gives rise to that grasping. Um, <clears throat> the inter interesting part about this presentation is um, uh, it, it doesn't specifically talk about how, uh, you know, a sense of self is formed or not. Um, uh, we have to dig into the name and form piece a little deeper, the number four. So uh, what we do from Dharma point of view is once the, we, the, uh, a self is uh, kind of posited on, on the five skandhas. So uh, it doesn't go into the skandhas uh, that deeply, but that's what's happening is, yes, then uh, it isn't, uh, we, we want pleasurable objects to keep going, but also we have a very strong attachment to a main pleasurable object um, ourselves. So it's in the uh, area of consciousness and name and form that we, we begin to form a self that feels that it will gain uh, a sense of uh, satisfaction and help, uh, happiness when it uh, can really, uh, keep and hold on to pleasurable people and nice people, nice objects, and avoid unpleasurable people and unpleasurable objects. So uh, how, how, the, how the self is uh, attributed or imputed to the um, five skandhas is, is like, that's a deep question, yeah. But the, Generally, the five skandhas are talked about form, which is our body. And then we have feeling, which we just talked about, which is just a pleasant or unpleasant uh, thoughts or sensations. Then we have, uh, we, start, we have discrimination, which is identifying things. And then we have what's called formations sometimes, um, uh, or compositional factors. So you can, uh, Basically, I just like to call these emotions <laughs> uh, because, um, uh, but it does involve thoughts. But usually all the things we're thinking about and feeling and having emotions are called compositional factors. And the reason we call them that is because at the time, uh, they feel really real and solid. You know, like I'm angry or I really want this thing or I don't really want it. It feels very solid but uh, we're, they're made up of other factors. In other words, they're composed of different things, so they're not solid and won't last. Then the fifth skanda consciousness is the ability to, uh, in a sense, form a sentence, like, I'm aware that I don't like this person or I don't like myself. So we're able to uh, you know, form this subject-object world with consciousness. <clears throat> but uh, when we do insight meditation, we go looking for, is, is any one of these skandhas a self in the sense of being something we own or something that arisen by itself, something that can endure? And uh, the Buddha said, well, I couldn't find anything. But we have to look ourselves. Who has a question? Okay, good. Hi, Karen. Go ahead. Uh, hi, Lama. Um, yeah. You know, I, I guess, I mean, this must tie in directly. Um, I'm taking a course on clashes, working with the clashes. And what I'm finding, you know, I, here I'm thinking I'm so self aware and all that, um, is that on certain clashes, you know, I know that they're there and I always have the same reaction to the same person. And so I can catch it, you know, right in the very beginning. You really have to like dissect your the whole sequence before it turns into some kind of flame <laughs> of, of emotional response, you know, but I can catch it early because I know that. But then I'm realizing now that I have a whole lot of unconscious things happening during the day that that I didn't even ever notice really before that are smaller and maybe not as big a flame, but still it's the same chain reaction is that you have this 
interaction or contact and then it starts this little ember and then all of a sudden the storyline mm. starts and then all of a sudden it's into this big giant thing. And so that's, right. um, that's it's just been really interesting to see how, who I, you know, I'm thinking, oh, I've got a kind of a half a handle on all that. That's, that's not true at all. I really am missing a lot of stuff because of my uh, non-awareness of, of my clashes. I just want to. Yeah, put that's that a good up. point. Thank you. Yeah. Who who are you doing the clashes with? I can't remember. It's online. Uh, it's Pema Chodron. Nice. Pema Chodron. Yeah, did, nice. yeah, yeah, she's very good at describing just how it goes. At, uh, you know, and and she's also very has a good sense of humor, and has been through it all. You know, in the way she describes it, but just being able to catch it before that ember becomes the bigger flame of emotion you know it's been really helpful to dissect it really detailed um so but it's really hard really hard it's hard yeah it's, it's hard we time. have to <laughs> yeah so sometimes i like to call pema children uh tonglen rinpoche you know yeah um, and then when she's talking about the clashes uh sometimes it, she just makes it sound fun like you know her her style is very playful yeah so, but we have to, we have, we're, when we're doing deep meditation, we're trying to, uh, you know, catch things at, at the first degree before they, you know, the, the first little spark, uh, because that does turn into a forest fire, as you say. An important piece, uh, I'd like to just uh, uh, segue on that is that where, where do we break this chain? And that's been a big discussion among uh, meditators, Dharma people, uh, and people in general. Like, okay, so we we don't we want to break this chain of compulsive behavior. So uh, where do we cut the chain? That's uh, been uh, you know lots of debate on that. So I'd like to put it out to you. So where where do you catch yourself and um, you know defuse the bomb, so to speak? Would anybody like to weigh in on that? Okay, Susan, you're on. Um, actually, my, I, I raised my hand before you asked about that. So can I ask about becoming? <clears throat> Bhava, yeah. Um, I've always been, I'm confused about becoming. I, I have also read that that is the spot during, or the, the link during the death process when one is so fearful of leaving the body and leaving the life and not be, being anymore, that that's what jumps you and pushes you into rebirth. And then you were talking about becoming also, and this may be part of where you could break the, the, the chain of habitual reaction, uh, is patterns that will be repeated and habits. And this is the place where we don't understand change and impermanence. So can you talk more about becoming? I'm, I'm confused by it. Maybe that is the place to, or one of the places to break the link. Yeah. Um, uh, each one of these is like a big uh, Dharma talk um, and different approaches with the different uh, uh, you know philosophic systems and tenets and stuff like that so uh, I, I'm not trying to give definitive answer like that um, uh, maybe provisional for now but um, uh, Sometimes becoming is talked about like throwing karma, right? So uh, the, uh, the arrow uh, has been shot from the bow, but it hasn't reached the target yet. So it's in a state of becoming. We've loosed the arrow, but it hasn't, you know, it hasn't uh, reached the target yet. So, it, so then could you then direct the arrow and change the intended target? 
Well, once the arrow has been loosed, right? So then, then, you know, what do we do then? In a, in a sense, we're always in an act of becoming. So we, we've started different, you know, situations and they haven't totally come to fruition yet, but they're, they, the, you know, the, the runner is off running, the horse is out of the stall, right? So, uh, you know, what do we do then is, is important. So uh, that's a big part of uh, Dharma practice and training is, well, of course, we find ourselves we, in this kind of uh, mess, right? So we can't just start all over again fresh. We're in the state of becoming. So uh, if an arrow is flying toward its target, then we have to do something to intercept it or move the target. So, so much of Dharma practice is um, trying to uh, uh, start a, a golden wind so that you blow the uh, arrow to miss the target a little bit because it, it's already, you know, the, the action has already happened. So karma uh, and cause and effect um, can be influenced, otherwise we're really doomed. <laughs> so we, you know, we we've started a process over the last several hundred years of industrial pollution and like that. And um, of course, if nothing happens, the planet will end up really being even sicker than it is now, right? But then people say we can. Uh, reverse or maybe stop the process or ameliorate it. And that, that would be working with this kind of becoming. <clears throat> so it, it is a place where we can deeply influence the, um, and, and it is a link that we could loosen and break through the becoming. Is that helpful? Yeah, thank you. That is very helpful. Yeah, so uh, um, in Vajrayana, we, we say there's nothing that can't be purified like that. So even in Vajrayana, we say um, even non-virtuous things or crazy things uh, can be purified, can be released and liberated. So um, that's even a good, right? So... Uh, the becoming is um, where sometimes people get discouraged. They don't see the fruition um, yet, and then they become discouraged. So it's it's really good practice. Like uh, the in between becoming is called the bardo, like that. So a lot can happen in the in between. So I'm looking up. Like I see hands raised from Annette. So maybe Annette, can you hear me? Hi. You have to turn on your mic though. Sorry. Um, hi, Lama. Yeah, thank you for this teaching and, and thank you to Connor. I've had a lot of confusion around mm -hmm. aspects of the 12, 12 links for some time. Um, I just lost my question. Okay. Um, Maybe it'll come back to me. I Oh, I'm sorry. I was going to respond to what I thought your question was before Susan's question. And I was going to just mention that when I feel kind of the, the anger and irritation arising within me, uh, uh, you know, during the interaction, um, the first thing I try to do is just, just tap into uh, the physical sensation that arises within my body, it's usually a sense of flushing, heat, uh, my heart rate will normally go up. And then I just kind of move into what story are you starting to tell yourself about this? And is it accurate? And then, you know, when I find myself not able to control my, my irritation, annoyance, um, and aggravation, I, I just kind of move into, you know, my mantra. And I, I mean, I just wanted to share that because I don't know if that even addresses the question, but it, it's just how I'm trying to approach um, 
some of, um, you know, the negative emotions I feel when people come at me um, in a confrontational and um, challenging way. I, I, so anyway. Yeah, good point. Um, you mentioned sensation first, like feeling, and that is one important place to loosen or, or, or break in the chain, or sometimes I call the dominoes, right? Uh, because actually um, getting strong craving or strong aversion doesn't feel good. You see, we're a little nutty. We, we think, well, craving feels really good because we're imagining getting it fulfilled through uh, a lasting pleasure. Um, and then we can imagine like uh, discharging anger will feel good because we'll be getting rid of the obstacle that anger likes to get rid of. But when we're really paying attention to sensation, as a lot of people do, or like body workers and um, people that are very somatic oriented, then you're really paying attention, like actually anger doesn't feel good and craving doesn't feel good. So, um, you know, for most, most of the people we're upside down, like the anger feels really good and we can't wait to get angry, you know, and then the craving feels really good because we think we'll be able to get it satisfied. But the sensation itself, uh, you know, doesn't feel good of, of craving. So what should feel pleasurable, of course, is kind words and, um, you know, being present and aware. So this idea of pleasure and uh, compassion and pleasure and wisdom uh, is uh, the forerunner of uh, the bliss-filled wisdom of primal awareness, right? But sensation is really important. So... Um, and Tantra particularly, uh, we're meant to pay attention to sensations uh, and what goes on in the body. It's funny, when we're doing shamatha practice, just kind of in the side, um, and uh, the Vajrayana tradition is, uh, it goes right to working directly with the mind, right? There's not that much talk about um, body sensations or energy, right? In uh, Vajrayana shamatha. Whereas um, now in the West, with um, you know the mindful Vipassana movement, there's a lot about being in the body. So in the Theravada tradition, they're much very much into starting with sensations uh, and noticing that uh, the you know the craving sensations, the aversion sensations don't feel good. Whereas um, generally in the Mahayana traditions, um, we're going to start with. Uh, directly working with mind and um, then uh, later bring in, uh, you know, working with uh, strong energies like sensations and so forth. It's interesting. I don't know, you know, which, which one works better. We'll see. Where else should we um, uh, break the chain? Or as I call it, the dominoes. The dominoes uh, for most people are very close together. So if one goes down the rest, but if we do Dharma practice, then the dominoes are uh, <laughs> six feet apart, right? So <laughs> one falls down, the other one is still standing, right? So you don't go into a chain reaction. So uh, that's why I like, I, I, if I could change a Dharma thing, I would say that the 12 dominoes of dependent origination. But I'd like to hear from, um, where? Oh, okay, good. Ask. Evan, go. Please ask a question. Where is he? Can you hear me? No? I can't see Evan as a person, so Evan, you'll have to chime in if you have a question that you sent through uh, text. Oh, sorry. Okay. Yeah. But you, you could type it and then Connor could ask me. So, can we do that? Maybe Evan will get it working. So let's come to Dirk then. Maybe come back to Evan. Hi, Dirk. Hello, hello. Oh, my home. So I was wondering uh, if, uh, you know, if we start with the mind, don't we start with kind of start with ignorance? 
Yeah, we do. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, as the you know, as the place where you can really cut the chain. Yes. Uh, uh, it's either the easiest part, easiest place, or the hardest place, because uh, ignorance tends to hide out, right? You know, it's like the um, the the thief or the murderer that's also the cop, you know. So uh, it, it's sometimes hard to uh, start there, but um, generally, um, the more we uh, progress in the path, we're going to be directed towards uh, uh, the mind and ignorance itself. Um, but uh, ignorance can take many forms, so we can just be ignorant of the fact that, you know, on very conventional truths that composite things change, right? So um, in a way, uh, we could say that, you know, it, it all starts with the Buddha telling the truth, what is. It all starts with knowing because he's just, with even the original students at Sarvasti, he's just saying, well, you know, uh, I'm going to tell the truth about suffering and the beginning of suffering, the end and the path, and, um, you know, uh, directly address um, ignorance through telling the truth. So um, in, in Dharma, uh, sometimes we do pursue delusions a little bit to try to unpack them, um, but uh, uh, that's kind of starting from the bottom, so to speak. But um, also we have to start at the top is just, uh, you know, proclaim the way things are from the very beginning and, um, you know, keep doing it. So at Lions Bar, we have to teach both, um, you know, fundamental uh, dharma, uh, kind of, right, sarvastavadin kind of dharma, and we have to teach Dzogchen at the same time. And then, you know, you, you're, the idea is you're kind of uh, creating this cone <laughs> effect, uh, where, and then you, you kind of uh, drive the ignorance into a corner like that. So, uh, you know, Dharma is finally, you know, uh, a combination of uh, an emotional maturity and uh, an uh, intellectual maturity that we call this kind of blissful wisdom or primordial awareness uh, uh, like that. We just have to know things, and the only way to do them is people to do th both at once is to, like, um, say uh, uh, the earth is not flat, it's spherical, or we can start with the earth is spherical, it's not flat. So, or we can say, go discover yourself or something. Which style do you think you prefer? I don't really prefer one or the other so much as I like to have both. I like to know that yeah. it's not flat, and I like to know that it is spherical. <laughs> yes. So we want to have a co-emergent awareness, right? So it's so wonderful. Uh, so uh, Buddhas can see uh, absolute truth and relative truth and delusion all clearly at the same time. So well, that's very blissful, right? Then that's a very blissful experience to be free and to know freedom and then to be able to benefit others. So in Vajrayana Tantra, um, the fast way is to do everything at once. But if we're gonna do everything at once, uh, I think you'd agree we, we at least have to have things lined up properly. <laughs> that's, that's the hard part. Yeah. So Seems like if you, Go ahead. If you're going to do everything at once, you at least have, have to have something to stand on to begin with. Yeah, we have to have a foundation. So the ground uh, path <clears throat> and fruition and conduct have to be there, but we need the ground, you know, like we have to somewhat know where we start from. But uh, Vajrayana is definitely like 
tells the truth because everything is happening at once. We can't um, we can't just line it up in a linear path, and we can't uh, just start all over again. Well, you could you could say I'm going to wait until my next rebirth, and hopefully, you know, it'll be better. But I wouldn't count on it. I don't know. Like that. Yeah. So it all goes. Uh, it, it all comes back to we we must remove delusions and see things as they are. So it goes back to ignorance. <clears throat> in Theravada style, um, for in a lot of practical ways, um, and even in Vajrayana, we have we first start with uh, you know eliminating contact and eliminating, uh, uh, you know, sensation, craving, grasping, right? So if we are going to eat the whole chocolate cake, we just don't even buy one and bring one home. So even us tantricas, we have to say, please, please don't buy chocolate cake and bring it home. Do you, do you agree? <laughs> because <laughs> so, if it is there I will eat it <laughs> when there when there isn't this there isn't that that's right when you don't have the chocolate cake you can't eat it yeah so even though uh, I'm I'm really trying to practice uh, as my teachers have instructed to practice like Guru Rinpoche even though my view is vast. My activity uh, has to be as fine as barley flour. So I have to be perfectly aware of uh, if the chocolate cake is in the refrigerator, I will eat it. <laughs> Even knowing that chocolate cake has no inherent existence and the person eating it has no inherent existence and the chocolate cake is, uh, you know, merely imputed and the chocolate cake is a direct uh, expression of enlightened awareness itself. Nevertheless, if I eat it, I, I will have to buy some new pants. <laughs> 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 so in Vajrayana, we have to say, yes, of course, uh, you know, this kind of good and bad uh, is, is imputed, can't exist in the ultimate, but will you be satisfied and will others be satisfied with the karmic consequences? So we always ask ourselves with that. So uh, one time I did ask, um, you know, Chadgad Rinpoche uh, uh, after a talk, you know, I said, Rinpoche, you're, you're saying everything is like impermanent, like a dream. So, uh, you know, why are we going to all this trouble? Um, I'd already done a lot of practice, so it was a totally annoying question. Um, and... Uh, uh, he's very kind. He says, well, honestly, wouldn't you rather have a good dream than a bad one? So I agreed like that. Um, so this is when Chad Gudrimshe was um, uh, living at um, Paul and Nancy's house in Nevada City. And uh, on their 10-acre land, I think still 10 acres, uh, Hillary might have seen it, I don't know. There's... Um, a 15-foot uh, statue of Guru Rinpoche rising out of a lotus on that land. So um, Chad Guru Rinpoche was an incredible artist and, um, you know, of course, built many of the statues at Riggs and Ling. <laughs> yeah, so let's see, what time is it now? So. We need to say goodbye soon, but um, I, I should be giving a talk where you should be wanting more. Um, that's good dharma, so you want to hear more in the future. But um, the two areas that in dharma we do focus the most on is the ignorance and you know working with the uh, craving and grasping. <clears throat> so those are the two. We have to work on those both duly. Um, it, it's not generally enough to say, well, I'll, I'll stop negative actions when I become enlightened, um, because that probably won't happen like that. We, we have to work with our conduct um, 
and our action while at the same time we're working on the view like that. So all the wonderful um, teachers I've known uh, that I continued to respect uh, had the highest view and also uh, the most wonderful conduct like that. <clears throat> so is anybody else wanting conversation? Can't see. Yeah. So at <clears throat> uh, the beginning of the talk, I, I wanted to talk you know, about karmic consequences where um, even though we may, our mind may be completely free, um, uh, our body making of compositional factors is going and form is going to respond to, uh, you know, viruses and under the un unhealthy things. So um, I'd like to emphasize that uh, we can do much on a relative world. Uh, we don't have to uh, say, I'll, I'll just meditate things away. We're doing both at the same time. Uh, probably just a little bit of a pitch, and I'm not perfect, but probably uh, the, uh, the less animals we eat, <laughs> the better, don't you agree? So uh, uh, we need to pay attention to the most basic areas like our food system and to be aware that um, we, we can change, you know, our patterns uh, and, you know, help change the planet just through our simple ways of how we eat and, uh, you know, what we do with our uh, uh, food like that. I think that's a huge part. Um, uh, you know, lines are, you know, people have to make up their own decision because these are deep decisions that come from the center, but, um, uh, you know, we have a couple of vegetarian uh, teachers that come here. I think uh, Arjun Rimshe and Kansa Rimshe, isn't that so? Um, Tibetans generally eat meat, but they would only eat very rare occasions. But now um, when they're in India, they're finding it's really just a good idea to eat vegetables. Uh, so it's such a hot climate. So uh, do you want to make a pitch for the new year to be uh, healthy and uh, take care of each other? <clears throat> Hopefully at some point uh, soon, we'll be also meditating outdoors. I like the idea of sitting outdoors. Um, so I was just talking to Peter about um, you know, sitting out in the garden area um, to re remain warm outside. The most important part is uh, to have uh, the ground warm. So that's why we need to put down something like some padding, um, maybe the kind we see in restaurants um, so that we're, we're not sitting on the bare ground because that'll keep us cold. If we're sitting on like some kind of uh, cushion then and with uh, a blanket, then you can sit in quite uh, cold temperatures. Um, uh, some yogis in the past uh, would sit on tiger skins. We don't want to do that. <laughs> we we want to sit on um, some non-animal product. So, uh, you know, Peter's willing to uh, put in a lot of energy uh, for this and uh, uh, continue to show up in the morning. So I'd like to give a shout out uh, of gratefulness to Peter. Thank you, Peter. Yeah. <clears throat> so um, <clears throat> uh, we'll talk more about uh, ignorance and craving and grasping, <laughs> I'm sure, and into the details of that um, at another time. So uh, Happy New Year, and I hope people stay safe. And uh, I like to hear from people, so uh, please continue to text and email. So maybe we should do closing. No, Mama, could I make a pitch before we close? Oh yes, yes. For uh, on New Year's Day, we're going to be doing the King of Aspiration prayers all day. We'll be reciting it all day from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. And you can come for as much or as little as you like. But at 10, at I mean 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. <laughs> Uh, 
I, I'm not sure I said it right the first time or not. Uh, at the very beginning, we'll be doing the context part of the, the prose part of the sutra that the prayer comes from. But for the rest of the day, we'll just recite the, the verses of the King of Aspiration prayers. And that's on the uh, calendar, the link for the, for the uh, meeting. Yeah, thank you. So uh, this is a classic prayer that can be approached on so many levels, uh, also approached from uh, Zogchen level of awareness. So, uh, and also bits of the text from uh, the prayer, which is part of the uh, Avatama Saka Sutra um, linkage. So you'll see it in other prayers, like in Guru Yoga, you'll hear bits from uh, the Samantabhadra prayer, like that. So thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's see, other announcements is, um, my understanding is Susan's course on uh, Shanti Davis continuing. Is that true, Susan? Yeah. On the, yes, on the second and fourth Saturday at 10 a.m. And you'll let new people in, isn't that so? That's not closed, yeah. right? No, no, of course not. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm just doing marketing, reminding oh, people. Oh, okay, yeah. Marketing. Anybody can come. <laughs> Two new people yesterday, so that was nice. Oh, good. Yeah, so, um, you know, Shanti Deva's entering the Bodhisattva's path is, um, uh, you know, one of the books that uh, I think you should take onto your desert island or take into retreat. Um, you know, particularly since Shanti Deva was uh, considered to be like one of the worthless monks. And people should know the story briefly. Like, Shanti Deva is one of the monks that didn't look like he was studying or would just do the minimal. And so the other monks, you know, uh, at Nalanda were getting really tired of him. Um, and they thought they couldn't kick him out because he wasn't disobeying any precepts overtly. So they decided like they'd shame him into leaving, which is a very common Asian way of doing things. And like, well, if you give a talk, you know, then you'll be such an idiot that you, you, you'll want to leave before giving the talk or you'll just be ashamed and leave. So uh, they said, would you please give a talk? And uh, they upped the ante by saying, um, would you like to give it from an established text or would you like to do something of your own composition? And he surprised them by saying, I'll do it of my own composition. So then they went away grinning, thinking, oh, he's going to fall flat on his face. And, uh, you know, we might even win some money on this one. Uh, so uh, the Bodhichara Vitara actually is considered to be a talk that was then transcribed. And uh, there are a couple of different versions, actually. Um, so uh, it's most interesting that it's, uh, could you imagine just giving uh, that talk uh, extemporaneously like that? So uh, I don't know if he gave it all at once or um, gave it over several days. What do you think? Well, what I do know is that we're finding it to be incredibly rich. I mean, the, we're having all of us that are part of the discussion are just going, wow, you know, there's just so much in here. How, how long do you think it would take to read it out loud in English? Four hours, maybe? Would it take that long? Uh, maybe. maybe. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. It's about 100 stanzas per chapter, and there's 10 I, yeah. chapters. Uh, that would be a typical Indian talk. <laughs> a typical Dharma talk would be about four hours. So um, four or five hours, something like that. <laughs> not not one hour or two hours. So it, I, I think it would be very possible that was all done in one sitting like that. For reals, for reals, yeah. Okay, so any other announcements before we sign off? Also on New Year's Day, Kamshana Rishi was doing purification practice uh, at 7.30. And yeah. everyone can hear you, right? Yes, yeah, yeah. I think so. Okay, that's good. Yeah. So um, I hope people can do next year some meditation outside 
it's nice to have a temple inside building because uh, then we have beautiful tankas and a shrine. But uh, traditionally, yogis have spent a lot of time outdoors. Um, Dirk has sent me various photos of, of snow in Pennsylvania. So I'm sure at some point he'll, he'll send me uh, a photo of him sitting at least briefly outdoors. I'm sure that's coming soon. <laughs> <laughs> Just pulling your leg, it's okay. <laughs> Stay warm. All right, so let's uh, do closing prayers like that. Due to the merits of these virtuous actions, may I quickly attain the state of a Guru Buddha and lead all living beings without exception into that enlightened state. May the supreme jewel bodhicitta that has not arisen arise and grow, and may that which has arisen not diminish, but increase more and more. In the land encircled by snow mountains, you are the source of all happiness and good. All powerful Chenrezig Tenzin Gyatso, please remain until samsara ends. May the te teachings of the Buddha flourish, and may the upholders of the teachings remain forever. May all migrators achieve happiness and may they fulfill all the temporary and ultimate goals. Low song, magical display of the deep awareness of all the victorious ones, merciful giver of a stream of profound and vast instructions to the fortunate migrators, please remain always unperishing, unchanging, unfading. Avlok Teshvara, great treasure of objectless compassion, Manjushri, master of flawless wisdom, Rajapani, destroyer of the entire host of Mars, Sankapa, crown of jewel of the snowy land sages, Lo Sangapa, I make request at your holy feet. Okay, ciao. Oh, good, we do this. Very good. The verses. Can you read those out too? Is that okay? Sure. Yeah, let's just do that once. All right. Yeah, all the diseases. Diseases that disturb the minds of sentient beings and which result from karma and temporary conditions, such as the harms of spirits, illness, and the elements, never occur throughout the realms of this world. May whatever sufferings arise due to life-threatening diseases, which, like a butcher leading an animal to the slaughter, separate the body from the mind in a mere instant, never occur throughout the realms of this world. May all embodied beings remain unharmed by acute, chronic, and infectious diseases, the mere names of which can inspire the same terror as would be felt in the jaws of Yama, Lord of Death. May the 80,000 classes of harmful obstructors, the 360 evil spirits that harm without warning, the 404 types of disease, and so forth, never cause harm to any embodied being. May whatever sufferings arise due to disturbances in the four elements, depriving the body and mind of every pleasure, be totally pacified, and may the body and mind have radiance and power, and be endowed with long life, good health, and well-being. By the compassion of the gurus and the three jewels, the power of the dakinis, dharma protectors, and guardians, and by the strength of the infallibility of karma and its results, May these many dedications and prayers be fulfilled as soon as they are made. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, ciao. Yeah. Bye. Bye. <laughs> That's good. Everyone moving quickly. Thank you, Lama. Yeah, thanks, thanks Elizabeth, and others. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lama. Yeah. Thanks, Elizabeth.